Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. My name is Max Bergman, and I'm the director of the Europe program here at CSIS. It is our tremendous privilege today to host the Foreign Minister of Finland, Pekka Havisto, for a conversation on Finland's perspectives on transatlantic security. The world has obviously been transformed by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Europe has united like never before. And it, and it is, of course, just a week after Finland's historic decision to apply to join NATO. There is much to, dis there is much to discuss, and we are honored to have Foreign Minister Havisto here in Washington and at CSIS. Uh, a quick few words about Minister Havisto's background. Uh, he has served as uh, Finland's Minister of Foreign Affairs since 2019. He has been a member of the Finnish, Finnish Parliament on and off uh, since 1983. The minister has also served in a variety of government, pos government positions in the past, including Finland's Minister of Development and the Environment and its Minister of International Development. He has also served in multilateral bodies, including the UN and the European Union. We are delighted he could make the time to join us on an incredibly busy trip uh, to Washington uh, and at such a critical moment. Uh, I also want to invite our, our online virtual audience to submit their questions uh, to us through the Ask uh, Live Questions Here button on our event page. And I will do my best to bring them in, in into the conversation. Uh, but before, before we get to our back and forth, I want to turn the floor over to Minister Havisto for some opening remarks. Thank you so much, sir, for, for joining us. The, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Max, and it's great to be here with you and, and, and also with the audience uh, online. And, and thank, thank you for taking up the, the very crucial topic of Finnish and, and European perspective on the current security situation. And maybe first to, to say that the US-Finnish relationship, of course, is now more active than, than uh, earlier. We have a very regular contacts now between Helsinki and Washington. And this is also what brings me now to, to Washington and, of course, we are following also the tragic events in Ukraine, but, but of course the Finland's request to join the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, is, is also our topic today. I will meet with the Secretary Blinken, and I had yesterday eight senators and, and so forth, so this has been a very active visit now to Washington. Let me first run through the, how we got to this moment of, in time, and, and the 24th of February, 22, of course, was also for us a turning point when Russia launched a massive invasion against the sovereignty of, of its neighbor. Of course, the offensive was a shock uh, to the whole world. Russia, which has willingly joined the European security order, now wants to annex and control its sovereign and independent neighbor, Ukraine. In December, Russia started the diplomatic preparations in the form of ultimatums, and countries between NATO and Russia would not have full sovereign rights to decide over their own destiny. Their security interest would be permanently subjugated to Russia's, in Russia's. Indeed, even some NATO countries would not have full rights as alliance members. This interpretation was confirmed by Russia's attack. When people ask us why did you not react uh, early, earlier, for example, when Russia invaded Georgia in 2008 or when it annexed Crimea in 2014, my answer to that is actually uh, uh, including five points. First, the European security architecture has failed regarding Ukraine. The security order established during the Cold War and, and uh, which was enshrined in the OEC agreements and principles could not stop a full-scale war in Europe. And of course, as you know, the OEC is very dear to us Finns because of the Helsinki Final Act 1975 and so forth. Secondly, Russia was able and willing to gather over 100,000 soldiers against a single neighboring country without having to mobilize additional forces. Thirdly, we see the, that Russia is now willing to take higher risks, including casualties, to attempt to try to change the regime of a neighboring country of over 40 million people cannot be described as a calculated risk. Fourthly, there is more and more loose talk in Russia about weapons of, of mass destruction, including tactical nuclear weapons and chemical weapons. This has led to many Finnish citizens asking, what would we do if we were threatened with these types of weapons? And fifthly, the rules of warfare, like the Geneva Conventions, are not respected. When we look at all the human rights violations in, in, in Ukraine, we can see that uh, a lot of uh, violations against the Geneva Conventions happening. 
the burden of the war was uh, war has of course been borne by Ukrainians they pay the price of Russia's brutal invasion and we support them fully heartedly Russia's attack has failed to achieve some of its key targets Kyiv remains firmly in Ukrainian hands and the legitimate government prevails Russia's invasion has had unexpected outcomes first of all we have seen the Ukrainians rallying to defend their country culture and democracy in a way that can only inspire others secondly there are consequences that are only beginning to unfold Ukraine and Russia are major food exporters who together provided about 30% of world wheat, wheat exports. Ukrainian fields and infrastructure are now being destroyed. Consequences will be felt globally as shortages uh, when prices are rising. I wish also to thank the Biden administration for highlighting food security also in the UN Security Council. Lastly, Russia's neighbors have reacted. Carefully coordinating with the United States and other partners, the European Union has showed unprecedented speed and decisiveness in condemning and sanctioning Russia and in delivering defense material to Ukraine. These sanctions deliver a massive blow to Russia's economy, trade and war effort. Let me now turn to Finland, where the popular opinion had remained for some time rather skeptical towards NATO membership. Anyhow, anyhow, we have been keeping this, what we call a NATO option, in our security white papers, I think since 2004, when we have said that if the security situation changes around the Baltic Sea area, we are ready to reconsider the possible NATO membership. And of course, uh, after the events in Ukraine, there was soon a majority, then over 60% support for joining NATO. When the parliament voted uh, now NATO membership, there were 188 representatives out of 200 supporting submitting an application for the NATO membership. The latest polls show that 76% are in favor of joining NATO. This is the highest figure ever in Finnish opinion polls. And of course our closest neighbor Sweden has also made the same decision and we have really prepared this process hand in hand and for us it's very important because we have so close military cooperation, defense cooperation also with, with Sweden and we both have been partners of NATO. Then a good question that what happens next? First of all, of course, we maintain our support to Ukraine. That's the only way to ensure that Ukraine is in a strong position in possible future peace negotiations with Russia. Finland, together with the EU and the United States, stands firmly behind Ukraine and its people. Second point is that while the rules-based international system and the European security structures, such as the OECE, could not prevent the Russian aggression, we must not abandon them. We will also need various forums after the war. Thirdly, from a European and Finnish perspective, I see that the rapid and smooth accession process to NATO for Finland and Sweden serves everyone's interests. We naturally fully respect the right of every NATO member state to go through their parliamentary processes and all concerns or questions by member states will be addressed accordingly. We wish to continue our constructive dialogue with the Allies and are ready to continue the discussions on the outstanding issues. I'm very grateful for the unwavering support that we have received from the United States throughout the process. We appreciate the widespread bipartisan encouragement and I look forward to the Senate approving our membership. Really yesterday, uh, possibly to talk uh, directly with the six, eight senators and I, I, I could really feel that there is a bipartisan support to, to our case. We value also the commitment that President Biden made last week to deter and confront any aggression during the accession process. Our membership in NATO is, after a thorough consideration, for the best of European and transatlantic security. Finland is taking this step following a close and wide-ranging partnership with NATO for almost three decades. Finland, in our understanding, is a security provider. The Finnish armed forces are strong and can already operate seamlessly with NATO. The Finns' willingness to defend their country is among the highest in the whole world. Finland's security model is based on a comprehensive approach and preparedness across the society and beyond the traditional military approach. Together with Sweden, we will make a strong contribution to the stability of the Baltic Sea region. As a country with, with a capable and well-trained military, as well as large wartime reserve of 280,000 soldiers, Finnish membership would strengthen the alliance as a whole. As a NATO ally, Finland will commit to the security of all allies. 
And then finally, Finland is also a strong proponent of cooperation between European Union and NATO. We must develop and mobilize the EU's security and defense related policies and capabilities, not to compete, but to complement NATO capabilities and capacities. And finally, Finland's membership in NATO is not a threat to anyone. We want to maintain our more than 800 miles border with Russia, a peaceful border. We only seek to enhance our own security and to contribute to a stable security order in Europe. As President Biden said, quote, new members joining NATO is not a threat to any nation. It never has been. NATO, NATO's purpose is to defend against aggression, unquote. Thank you for this opportunity of starting the no, debate. No, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Minister. I, I want to sort of start maybe with with some of your opening comments that that touched on why now, uh, because you mentioned uh, Russia invaded Georgia in 2008, Russia invaded Ukraine in 2014. There was also the opportunity after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, and I th you touched on many of those reasons. But what, was Russia's invasion of of Ukraine this time in 20? 22, a real shock to the Finnish population. What, did you see a real uh, a shift in how people viewed NATO, how people viewed Russia? Did that really change uh, the thinking and perception uh, within Helsinki as well, within the foreign ministry, within, uh, within the government? Well, I think there were two steps. The first step was uh, late last year when, when, when Putin and, and other leaders in Russia warned that any uh, uh, enlargement of NATO to the east will be uh, met, uh, met very seriously by, by Russia and, and, and they will react to that. And uh, probably the talk was more meant to Ukrainians and Georgians, mm -hmm. but in Finland and Sweden it, it actually attacked our mm -hmm. views of our possibility of, of joining NATO. And then when the February attack happened against uh, Ukraine, that was the second step when, when you see that uh, Russia is now ready to take very high risks. Of course, you can speculate that maybe Putin didn't have all the intelligence and maybe he was dreaming that this is a rapid operation or so forth. But we, we saw the readiness of Russia to take a very uh, bold steps, uh, which also are risky for their own security. A lot of losses, a lot of manpower loss, a lot of equipment lost. And of course, uh, you are living next to a neighbor that can do very unpredictable steps. And that, that was something that caused a big concern. I want you to maybe talk a little bit about the process and how uh, this decision uh, was, was tackled uh, by Finland. I was, had the pleasure of being in Helsinki uh, about six weeks ago and was deeply impressed by the sobriety at which all the political parties were, were t treating the subject, in which the, the government was approaching, in which the public was approaching it, but it, this marks a tremendous shift, I think, in the mm -hmm. identity of Finland, that we think of Helsinki summits, mm -hmm. President Trump and President Putin mm -hmm. being there, but also uh, you mentioned the Hel Helsinki final act, that Hel mm -hmm. Helsinki being this venue for kind of neutral conversation. Um, how, how will this sort of impact the identity of Finland, do you think, going forward? Well, first of all, we really, really think that the OEC and the Helsinki final act has been made to prevent wars in Europe. So that there is a mechanism. And of course, we saw a long time the negotiations between Ukraine and, and uh, Russia ongoing, the two Minsk agreements and so forth. And we were actually still up to January. Mm -hmm. There was this talk that, OK, we, we should implement the two Minsk agreements and, and this 100,000 troops on the Ukrainian border, it's only an exercise yes. and so forth. So there was a double talk, mm -hmm. actually at the same time talking that yes, we will solve this peacefully and, and, and secondly, uh, the preparing for a military reaction. And I think that was a shock for Finns. We, we didn't expect that there would be a full-scale war in Europe and, and actually somebody wants militarily change the government in a country of 40 million people, almost 10 times bigger than Finland. And, uh, and, and, and that, that was the reaction. And, and then actually the opinion shift first, I would say, happened in the public opinion. Mm -hmm. Then political parties started to react that, hey, this is a new situation. Uh, if we had earlier 30% of people supporting the NATO membership, maybe this is the time to use the NATO option that we have always been writing in our government programs. And, and then political parties started to have their meetings and then this came actually in the form of two white papers to the Finnish parliament. First, mm -hmm. only this kind of, I would say, an open-ended paper on, on security changes. 
and, and explaining what has happened, how this is affecting us, without any proposed solution, mm -hmm. but, but uh, telling how, how weak the security structures currently are in Europe and so forth. And that, that was a debate in the parliament. And then when the parliament came to the conclusion, step by step, that maybe the NATO option is the best, then we uh, delivered a second uh, white paper to the parliament proposing the NATO membership. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, of course, we had a very intensive dialogue with Sweden. I, I, I dare to say that we had a certain influence also to the Swedish process timetable and, and maybe to the result. And how important was it that for, for Finland that Sweden also make this move in, in tandem with you? Was that something you were very focused on or, or merely hoped for? How, how important was that for sort of Finnish foreign policy over the last few months to, to try to ensure that Sweden also joined with, with Finland? It was very important because we, we really have a very close military and defense cooperation with Sweden. We are po both partners of NATO, but we have also a lot of bilateral cooperation and so forth. Anyhow, we, at a quite early stage when we were asked, are you going to NATO even without Sweden? Our answer was yes. Mm -hmm. This is our decision. We, we, we cannot influence so much to the Swedish decision. We, we hope that they are coming on board, but, but it's their decision. But we, we came actually at a quite early stage to the conclusion that yes, we go now. And I, I want to ask about uh, your, your president when uh, had to uh, had the pleasure of calling Vladimir Putin to inform him that uh, Finland was making a decision to apply to join NATO. Strikes me as potentially a fairly awkward conversation. Is there anything you can uh, share about, about Putin's reaction, about Russia's reaction? You mentioned a lot of the, the belligerent statements prior to, uh, or prior to the decision to, to join NATO. Uh, what, what's been the reaction? What was Putin's reaction on the phone? I understand it has been a quite professional discussion. Of course, uh, President Nienist and President Putin have been meeting each other several times, have been calling to each other several times during the Navalny case and, and on, on our bilateral relations and so forth. So it's, uh, it's of course, a discussion between people who have uh, had contacts also earlier. And I think I appreciate it very much that President Nienister decided to call after President and Prime Minister had openly told their position on, on uh, NATO membership and when the Parliament was preparing it, not, not to ask permission, but to tell what decision has been made. And I think that's a, that was a very uh, mm -hmm. timely call. And, and I, some people were surprised, you know, uh, uh, abroad. Why do you call Putin in these mm -hmm. times? But I think uh, Russia will always be our neighbor. Yeah. And in all circumstances, the communication lines has to be kept open. That's part of the diplomacy. In, in going forward, now Finland finds itself in, in somewhat of a, an awkward period where you've applied to join uh, a military alliance. You are not yet a member. Uh, we, we saw back in 2016 Russia uh, uh, essentially back a coup attempt in Montenegro as they were waiting to, to join NATO uh, in order to s circumvent or subvert that process. Uh, what are you concerned about in this intervening period? There's been um, a lot of foreign leaders have traveled to Helsinki, uh, uh, Prime Minister Johnson, uh, Emmanuel Macron. There's a, a, a relations being developed between the UK and France about security guarantees. Uh, what, what are you, uh, how is Finland approaching this period? What are you looking for? What are you nervous about in terms of Russia's reaction? And what, what do you expect also from the United States? At the beginning of this process, at the early spring when, when the discussion started, uh, March, March and, and, and so forth, when, when we uh, started to discuss about the issue, we of course were looking what are the possible risks. And of course, traditional military risks, violation of uh, uh, sea areas, violation of airspace, or uh, cyber threats, hybrid threats. We are very security-oriented people in mm -hmm. Finland. You know, we always go through the ne most negative scenarios, and we were going through those negative scenarios, and we understood that there are some negative scenarios which you cannot cope alone. And then we, of course, uh, were in contact with the governments which you mentioned, the US, UK, European governments, and, and what will be your support in the case that something bad happens. Mm -hmm. And of course, everybody said first, you are not under the uh, NATO Article 5, but some kind of security assurances, maybe not guarantees, but assurances can be given. And all countries, of course, gave their own statements. But starting from Boris Johnson, who visited very strong statement before our decision came, US uh, uh, reaction by Biden, uh, came the French reaction, Poland, 
actually bigger and smaller EU countries. And some of them, EU countries saying, hey, you are under the EU Article 42.7 already. Why do you even ask if you give so much support to Ukraine in these circumstances, which is not a member of European Union? Of course, we will come to your help if something happens. And I, I think these assurances helped us, of course, to make the final decision. And, uh, and when people are now asking, is something bad happening? We don't see anything. Our peace border is peaceful and, and, and so forth. And, and we have been saying that we, we don't expect anything, but we are prepared for everything. And have you seen any sort of uptick in, in Russian cyber activity or, or violations of Finnish airspace, any activity along the border? Are there any uh, concerning signs over, uh, over the last few weeks? I know Russia has its hands full in Ukraine, but I'm curious if there have been any signs of, of, of Russian activity toward, toward Finland over the last well, few weeks. Well, I would say on a quite normal level. Mm -hmm. Some violations of airspace uh, and of course the cut of the gas uh, pipeline but that was expected because mm -hmm. we, we refused to pay in rubles mm -hmm. the gas and so forth so but these are all consequences that we, we calculated uh, not, nothing surprising now I want to talk a, a bit about the ascension process you're here in Washington uh, there was a letter from more than 80 uh, US senators uh, we were talking before that, that Finland has really brought bipartisanship to Washington. Uh, maybe you could, if you could give us some color on, on the, your conversations that you had yesterday. I know you were up uh, on the Hill, you were talking to senators. Um, wh wh what are the prospects, do you think, for a speedy ratification for, for Finland? How did you uh, come away from those conversations? So we got, of course, here from the senators a very positive uh, feedback. and. and, and all of those who, to whom we were talking to welcomed uh, Finland actually saw that we are the net contributor of uh, security to NATO. We are not consuming resources, we are bringing resources. We are important for the, uh, uh, also for the Baltic states and, and, and so forth if Finland and Sweden joins. I think that was very positive. Then, of course, we got some questions about the Turkey and, and Turkey's position and, and also if there are other reservations by, by any NATO member countries and so forth. So it was a very very uh, good discussion and I could see that the uh, Senate is really wanting to speed, it, speed up its, its own decision making and we are very grateful for these 82 senators who have already uh, stated their position to this. Mm -hmm. We're getting a, a lot of questions coming in about uh, the one clear obstacle that has emerged potentially uh, in, for Finland's uh, ascension in Sweden as, as well uh, and that's uh, uh, the reaction from Turkey. Uh, there was a, a delegation of Finnish and Swedish foreign uh, officials going to Ankara to have talks with the Turks. Uh, what can you tell us about w your conversations with, uh, with your Turkish counterparts? How do you see this, this, this playing out? Well, basically, uh, I've been visiting Turkey twice uh, this spring, and, and our president has been calling to President Erdogan and so forth. And, and at, the, at the earlier stage, there were no indication of any problems. But uh, when we tabled the uh, uh, application, then uh, these problems occur, uh, strong reaction, uh, uh, suspicion that Finland and Sweden uh, harbor some terrorists in the, in the Turkish eyes and, and, and so forth, and, and some criticism that uh, about the arms trade restrictions and so forth. We understand that uh, there are a number of NATO countries who have had similar concerns and similar discussions with Turkey, but of course Turkey is uh, in a very decisive role at the moment because we need to have a consensus of all 30. Uh, NATO member states. So we sent the delegations on Wednesday. They uh, were in Ankara, started discussions using five hours and so forth, and we agreed to, to continue the process. And, but of course, we are, uh, we are also testing the open door policy of NATO. If NATO has open doors or, mm -hmm. or not, we, we, we think that it has, but, uh, but this is, of course, now it's up to the NATO also to, to partly handle this process. And in, in part of the argument for Finland. Uh, joining uh, NATO as in Sweden as well is that it's going to be an additive to the alliance. Now there's some that have offered the concern. Well, suddenly NATO's border with Russia becomes uh, much, much, much longer. What is your uh, what was your argument to the U.S. senators, to, to Turkey, to others about what does Finland do you think bring to this bring to the NATO alliance? Uh, uh, how will Finland uh, impact NATO going forward? 
Actually, I, I was arguing that we are bringing a long border, but a peaceful border. Mm -hmm. And when you look back to the history, most of the years it always have been peaceful border during different mm -hmm. administration. You know, you can start with the chart time and Lenin and Stalin mm -hmm. and Rutschev and Brezhnev and Gorbachev and uh, Yeltsin and now Putin and so forth. We have, we have seen many changes in our neighborhood mm -hmm. and we have always respected and, and trying to maintain a peaceful border, of course, with, with Russia. So this is our, our attitude. At the same time, of course, we see that uh, it's not only about Finland, but the whole NATO is, is facing new type of uh, challenges by, by Russia. It's not only uh, traditional military challenges, it can be hybrid influence, it can be cyber influence and so forth. And we think that we have a lot of capabilities of, of uh, addressing those, those risks. So it it's hopefully adds to the security of the whole alliance. I want to ask you a bit about the, the European Union. Uh, there's a mutual defense clause within the European Union, Article 42.7, and over the last decade, the EU has, has been doing a lot on defense and mm -hmm. spending uh, more money for various procurements, and we've seen the EU spend or allocate 1.5 billion euros for uh, security assistance to Ukraine. How, do you, how is Finland joining uh, uh, NATO? How will that impact the momentum behind EU defense? How do you, what role do you see for the European Union playing in, in, in defense uh, going forward? You know, our military expenditure, we, we are exceeding the 2% GDP, so we are fulfilling the NATO requirements mm -hmm. on, on, on that. And of course, we have, a, we have just ordered 64 F-35s, uh, and, and uh, uh, Sweden has very strong submarine fleet and submarine technology and so forth. So we, we think that we are adding to the overall security of NATO also with our military equipment. Of course, when you look at the European Union, actually, it has been maybe a surprise to everyone that when you look the front line on, on the support on Ukrainian issue. It has been European Union actually that has uh, launched uh, together of course with the US the sanctions, very uh, tough sanctions against Russia, but at the same time channeled a lot of uh, military support, military equipment, even lethal material from EU member states to Ukraine. Even Finland has been sending five packages of this military support and so forth. Uh, Everybody is quite surprised actually that the European Union who, is, who has a uh, maybe a uh, uh, tradition of not so easily agreeing on things on this issue have very rapidly agreed and, and mobilized quite a lot of uh, support. We, of course, as a European Union member, would like to have even closer cooperation between NATO and, and European Union on defense. And of course, European Union strengths are maybe more on the civilian defense side, on the hybrid issues on cyber and then the traditional armed defense, which is of course NATO's expertise, but I think it's very important that when we have the processes, the NATO's strategic concept and, and uh, European Union strategic compass actually developing at the same time, the, as close cooperation between these two institutions as possible would be good. And of course there's been a lot of attention here in Washington on Finland and Sweden, but, but Denmark is also going to have a, a vote about potentially joining the EU uh, military instruments. Uh, have you been in touch with your Danish counterparts? Have you been encouraging them, or what, what, what sort of conversations? Yeah, have I have been there? very delighted, actually, talking several times with my colleague Jeppe Kofford in, in Denmark on this, and, and this has really, actually, I, I think this is one of the consequences of the Russian attack against mm -hmm. Ukraine, that even their security thinking in, in Denmark has changed, and, and hopefully they can also join those mechanisms that we have in European Union security. And, of course, this would mean that, that all the Nordic countries if we are all NATO members, if we don't have any particular restrictions on, on EU uh, security issues, so then we can even more work together with, between the Nordics. I guess Norway is the one, the one holdout you have to, to work on them to, to apply to join the, the European <laughs> well, Union. Yeah, <laughs> this is what Stoltenberg, I think he said at some moment that he was thinking that I, rather Norway will join European Union before Finland and Sweden comes members of NATO. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> well, this, was, this goes vice versa now. <laughs> Uh, before we get to more audience questions, I want to ask you uh, about your analysis of uh, the situation in Russia and also the situation in the war in Ukraine. Uh, you're obviously one of the most astute observers about, uh, about Russia. F Finland focuses intensely on what's happening internally in Russia. What do you see playing out um, with the impact of economic sanctions, the stability of, of the Putin regime in, in, in the Kremlin? Uh, how how have how has Russia responded to this crisis, and and how do you see uh, uh, Russia moving forward in the next few months or years? Uh, do you see a stable situation in Russia, or do you think it, it, the situation become, could become quite volatile? 
Well, that's of course a question. I, I don't have any crystal ball, but, but first of all, there has been some of those peace plans between uh, Russia and Ukraine, some peace talks facilitated by Turkey. We have been trying to follow those processes, some, some papers tabled and, and so forth. But of course, it's very much up to the Ukrainians to decide what is the right moment to, to have any negotiations and discuss. And of course, it has been so bitter, the, the butcher human rights violations and so forth, that I understand fully the mood in, 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 uh, in Ukraine is, is maybe not so supportive for talks just at the moment. Mm -hmm. On, on uh, Russia, of course, when we look at the long-term consequences, the, the sanctions are affecting very negatively to their economy and so forth. But of course, Russia has a reputation of having a long resilience on, on, on this, and, and it, will, it will take months or, or years, who knows when this is really affecting and, and uh, many many of those of course the, who have other opinions than, than Putin has now left the country. If you look at the NGOs, uh, human rights organizations, environmental organizations, free journalists and so forth, they are uh, part of them are out of the country and of course this you, you cannot in the country hear these uh, critical voices so much. I'm going to go to some of the questions that we're, we're getting from the audience. We're getting uh, a number. Uh, from, um, from Breaking Defense, there's a question about what additional security assurances do you need from the U.S. during this time between now and your actual ascension to join NATO? Well, of course, at the moment, as I said, our border is peaceful, no particular threats. But of course, the, the capability to react rapidly if some threats occur. And, and of course, now we have been saying mainly, you know, the, the Navy visits and, and so forth will just show that there is this partnership taking part of the common exercises and so forth. But at, at the same time, we, we, we really are looking, uh, if things are keeping calm, then nothing particular, but of course the readiness to react rapidly if something occurs. Mm -hmm. And we have a, a question from Business Insider. that In, in a post-ascension environment, so after you join NATO, um, what role would Finland like to see NATO forces play in ensuring the security of Finland's Baltic coastal, uh, coastal areas and airspace? So after you join NATO, what role do you want to see NATO playing vis-a-vis uh, -vis Finland? Well, in the, our parliamentary debate, there was a lot of uh, discussion, mm -hmm. would there be a permanent basis and so yeah. forth, and then, then actually many, many parliamentarians referred to Baltic states that it's very difficult to get any permanent basis mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, and so forth. It's, it's actually, of course, our, on the first hand, we will take care of our own security. That's, that's clear. We will maintain our uh, military expenditure and, and take care of our own security. We will also participate, of course, then to the NATO common activities like the air patrolling in uh, Baltic states and so forth. We are sure that we are part of this kind of rotating mechanism. And then, of course, whenever and wherever uh, NATO needs, we are ready to participate to the common, common exercises. That's, of course, the normal routine of NATO. Then comes the NATO uh, security planning and, and military plans and, and so forth, of course, where, where we then participate from our, our part. And, 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 of course, looking very much the, the cooperation on, around the Baltic Sea. On, uh, there are many, several NATO countries then after Finland and Sweden has joined in. We have a, a question from, uh, from a U.S. Army officer asking whether the Russia scorched earth attacks on civilian infrastructure uh, change Finland's approach to uh, how it would defend against a similar attack uh, from Russia launched against infrastructure. Uh, how, would, how are you sort of seeing the events play out on the ground in Ukraine, the attacks on the infrastructure? What, what is the, uh, is that impacting how your military is, is thinking about defending itself and how are you, you're thinking yeah. about your but civilian actually, infrastructure? Actually, we are one of the maybe few European countries who still have this uh, tradition of building bomb shelters and, and even for uh, nuclear war and, mm -hmm. and so forth for all its citizens. Actually, it's in our legislation that we, we have to, I mean, if you, if you visit Helsinki, you can find a lot of uh, that, that, uh, uh, those installations and, mm -hmm. and, and, and readiness for, for all kinds of wars against the civilians and against the cities. Of course, that's, that's there, but, but we, have, we were shocked about uh, that civilians were targeted. We were shocked that uh, suburbs and, and cities were targeted and, and because so many rules of warfare has been violated and I think we, we of course appreciate very much the work of the ICRC and others who are Red Cross who are trying to, to work for in these circumstances but, uh, but we have been our reaction has been to support the International Criminal Court and, and mm -hmm. their investigations because it's, it's very important that those who are guilty for breaking the rules of the warfare will, will, will be processed. 
Can I ask, uh, just an extension of that, y you know, how sanctions have impacted uh, your economy and your interaction with Russia? Now, you know, we uh, we talked about the, the long border, but there was also a, lots of cross-border economic engagement, lots of travel back and forth, Russians coming up to visit Helsinki, uh, Finns going to St. Petersburg, uh, and, and a lot of cooperation in the energy sector. So what has been the impact on, on Finland's economy? Are that cross-border interaction still happening? Is there cooperation happening on environmental issues in the Baltic? What has been the, the impact on the economic side or, uh, or on the environmental side as well? Well, on the border first, we really, uh, I think in the most active years, we had the biggest Schengen visa factor in the world when our St. Petersburg consulate was uh, giving uh, maybe one million Schengen visas per year and there were seven million border crossings or something like that, so it was very active. Then, of course, the COVID time took it down. And we are still in, in this little bit in this post-COVID uh, tail, and at the same time the sanctions appeared. So, so the border crossing border is open, of course, and you can with your documents come over, but but not so many. I mean, not usual tourists at the moment, but people for family uh, connections and, and and some businesses that are not uh, sanctioned and so forth are. This is working. On on other cooperation forms, actually, we have freezed now. For example, the Baltic Sea cooperation, we have freezed the Arctic cooperation with Russia in these circumstances. But of course, for Finland, it has been very important that, for example, the environmental cooperation works. I'm thinking about the dumped nuclear waste around Nova Zembia mm -hmm. and around Kola Peninsula or, or the Baltic Sea cooperation and so forth. Of course, we have to come into the future situation that this cooperation continues, but at the moment it's freezed. There are economic consequences, but what Russia has not been so big economic player in, in the Finnish, Finnish economy and of course companies are trying to find new markets and, and so forth so, so currently no, no, no dramatic change. Of course the price of the energy, food prices, inflation, but these are common uh, now for all European countries as well. A lot of this is playing out in Brussels right now over uh, whether to, to push forward on, a, on an oil embargo. Uh, do, what, what do you think the prospects are of, of further uh, sanctions on the, on the oil and gas sector for, for Russia? But Finland has been advocating actually both oil uh, embargo and, and gas, gas embargo. No, there's no problem uh, from our side. But of course I can see that particularly the gas issue is, is very sensitive for some European countries where the consumers are using the, the natural gas from Russia. And, and then the governments are there saying that if we cut now the gas, People will go to the streets and they don't ask Putin down, they ask the national governments mm -hmm. down. And, and of course, we don't want to shoot our own leg. I think mm -hmm. that's, that's understandable. Yeah. But for Finland, these, these bans are not the problem. And how, if you were to sort of look forward a year, two years, five years, uh, when it comes to the energy uh, sector, do you, do you see Europe undergoing a massive transformation here? I mean, where do you think Europe will get through this current sort of spike in energy prices. How, how do you see Europe uh, going forward um, uh, with its decoupling from Russia? Is this just a temporary uh, step where eventually if there's a peace deal with Ukraine, Europe would go back to the Russian gas because it's so plentiful and right there? Or is this a, a permanent shift that we're seeing? I think this is a permanent shift. I, I, I feel that you can cut the pipeline only once. Mm -hmm. Because when you cut it, you are after that unreliable. Uh, in, in business mm -hmm. business terms and and, uh, and then if you look now what's happening in Europe uh, long uh, short term solutions LNG terminals LNG ships Finland just order one of those LNG ships from US and, and we have earlier already built a Baltic connector that we can take, get part, part of the gas from the Baltic through the Baltic states and so forth but LNG is, is this kind of short term solution on the, on the gas issue then when we look the long term solutions it's more on the green technologies and, and green uh, uh, transformation that's happening and, and wind energy, solar energy and, and so forth. I, I think this was a really wake-up call for, for Europe. Mm -hmm. Your prime minister is in uh, Ukraine or was in Ukraine uh, yesterday. Um, Ukraine is obviously pushing for EU membership. Uh, there's a lot of support for Ukraine, uh, especially among Eastern members of be becoming, mm -hmm. gaining candidate status. Uh, what is Finland's uh, uh, view on, on potential Ukraine membership in the, in the European Union? 
Well, when our Prime Minister visited uh, Kiev, and she expressed the, the support of, of having this, this status for candidate status for Ukraine. And, but of course, our main concern is we, we know that when you go through the Aki Comunitaire, it takes long time mm -hmm. and, and so forth, that something rapid, more rapid, should happen with, with Ukraine, the, the support from, from European Union to Ukraine. And of course, we are already looking at the reconstruction of the country. When, President Zelensky gave a speech to the Finnish parliament. He asked that if Finland can do something on the educational sector, if we can do something for the rebuilding of the schools and mm -hmm. so forth, when we have already uh, also achieved uh, refugees from Ukraine, more than 20,000 arrived to Finland, half of them are children. We have immediately started schooling for these children. Mm -hmm. But of course, we need also investment to schools in, in Ukraine. And these kind of issues are now discussed. Now, there's been um, a lot of uh, uh, debate going on in the European Union in Brussels about Ukraine membership. Uh, France, but also other Western European countries in particular, note that in, before Ukraine could potentially join, there has to be some reform to some of the rules, potentially treaty reform. Uh, Mario Draghi went to the floor of the European Parliament saying that the, we need to, the European Union needs to move away from uh, uh, unanimity on some of the uh, voting decisions um, so that not one country can block an entire union. What is Finland's view uh, on, on some of these proposed reforms that are being uh, thrown out? Well, there are a lot of different proposals, but for example on the foreign policy issues we have been thinking that this unanimity is, is a little bit too much, that yeah. it could be unanimity minus one or something like that, mm -hmm. that not a single country could block the European Union foreign policy decisions because that's, that's a bit of, and, and I think the disaster you can see it in the UN when, when European Union tries to form a common, common opinion on the UN affairs for example, it's not easy and, and it would be very beneficial if we could get the common foreign and security policy decisions more easily in European Union. And can I just ask an extension of that, one of the, the ways that the EU does its budgeting, and they do it in seven-year cycles, and, and they, uh, the budget passed in 2020, not anticipating that you would have this massive war, that there'd be a, a, a lot of money to expend on energy, uh, but a lot of the money allocated for the security assistance, the European peace facility, and, and other aspects of the defense side have been really drawn down. Is there a prospect of potentially plussing up or adding more funds to that, or, 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 or perhaps having another budget discussion short of that, that uh, seven-year cycle? Well, the European Peace Facility actually has been a very good tool for this, uh, uh, actually compensating the countries when they have been giving uh, defense material to, to Ukraine and, and also Finland has been using that facility and I, I think there is a pressure and it has been, uh, this amount has been raised already a couple of times and, and there is probably a pressure to continue continue with the, with the bigger uh, funding for, for those purposes. And I think on those issues we have been quite flexible and it has, it has worked quite rapidly, those decisions. And perhaps a uh, sort of final question about, and if we return to, to NATO, mm -hmm. we've talked a, a lot about what, what Finland brings to the alliance. Uh, what do you think Finland also brings to the broader security for NATO, especially in, in the Baltic? I've heard a lot of discussion that the high north now needs to be sort of a, a, an additional focus for, uh, for NATO planners. You know, previously without Finland and Sweden, uh, the focus was, uh, could be on the Arctic, but not necessarily uh, you know, on defending Finland. How, how do you think things will shift within inside of NATO and, and, and what do you hope to see in terms of where uh, NATO planners and NATO forces and, and other aspects of NATO planning uh, head? No, I'm thinking the high note of the Arctic issue certainly will be on, at the table if you think that uh, seven out of eight Arctic Council members are NATO members as well. That's, that's of course a new new issue and, and, and has to be addressed. But at the same time, of course, the, the, we are talking actively to, to countries of the eastern flank and particularly some of the southern countries are asking, is there now too much concentration going to be in the north and so forth? And, and we, we have been, our message has been that all these areas are important for us. So it's, a, uh, some people speak about the Nordic fortress or something like that. And I, I think it's, it's too much. We, we have to look uh, all those concerns and including, of course, the Mediterranean partners and their concerns. The, the Northern Africa issue is, is as relevant as, as others. So we, we, uh, we have to balance also inside NATO these issues. 
Well, Mr. Hafista, I know that you have uh, a tremendously busy schedule uh, here in Washington. You have a, another full day of, of meetings ahead of you. Uh, I, I wish you the best of luck in, in those meetings. Uh, and it is a tremendous honor and thrill that, that you came to CSIS today uh, and were willing to speak with us. And also, uh, best of luck in, in Finland's pursuit of, of NATO membership. I think uh, everyone on, uh, you know, almost everyone on the side of the Atlantic is, is rooting for you, you. Uh, and hoped, uh, I hope that this, this process is, is, is very speedy. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you for this opportunity of talking with you. Great. Thank you. And, and thank you so much for, uh, for all those that uh, attended online. Uh, and this video will be, uh, will live in perpetuity on the website. So, so please share it and, and send to your friends as well. Thank you so much. Thank you.